Good evening, everyone. My name is Marina Isgro, and I'm Associate Curator of Media and Performance Art at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Thank you so much for joining me and to Colby Satterwhite in conversation as part of the museum's weekly artist talk series, Talking to Our Time. Cart captioning and American Sign Language interpretation are provided for tonight's program. And you can find more information about both of those options in the chat. Tonight we'll be speaking for about 45 minutes and then opening it up to audience Q&A. So if you'd like to submit a question, um, feel free to do so at any time using the Q&A button on Zoom. And now I'm truly honored to introduce Jacoby Satterwhite. Jacoby is a Brooklyn-based artist who creates epic imagined worlds using digital animation, performance, and other media. He draws from popular culture, his family history, and the legacies of surrealism and fluxus to create work that is as visually enthralling as it is immersed in the social concerns of our time. As Ken Johnson wrote in the New York Times, it is a testament to Mr. Satterwhite's uncommonly elastic imagination that it can range so freely from the personal to the political to the metaphysical. Jacoby's work is included in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Whitney Museum, among others. He exhibits his work widely and internationally, including, um, I'll just mention the Gwangju Biennial earlier this month and House der Kunst in Munich later this summer. At the Hirshhorn, we're very lucky to be bringing a work by Jacoby into the collection. His video, Birds in Paradise, was recently approved for acquisition by the museum's board of trustees. Birds in Paradise is also the first featured work in our summer screening series, Lost in Place, Voyages in Video, currently on view on our website. So check it out. And again, we will put a link to that in the chat. So with that, let me welcome Jacoby. Please turn on your camera. Hello. There we go. Hey, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So tonight we're going to be um, focusing the conversation on your video practice. And we thought that we could start with your work, The Matriarch's Rhapsody from 2012. Um, so before we play that clip, um, for people who are watching who are maybe completely new to your work, maybe you could just kind of introduce the video and tell us a little bit about how you started working with your mother's archive. Okay, um, well, the Matrix Rhapsody, um, I created it around 2012 or 2011. Um, it was um, something I was kind of gestating and thinking about since 20, 2007. But it, um, like, when I kind of like had a standstill with painting and I was doing a couple of residencies and researching other kind of like genres of performing and genres of, uh, genres of making art actually, sorry. Um, and so I went back home for Christmas um, around 2008. And I re recalled that my mother was still making these drawings, schematic diagrams of common objects, which is the reason why I started making art in the first place. Um, I mean, I speed things up. Basically like the whole reason why I started making art is because I wanted to help my mother create these drawings thinking that she was an inventor for the Home Shopping Network. Later on, I found out that that delusion of grandeur was an actual schizophrenia, but it led me becoming an artist. So I felt like it was the place that I should return to as an adult and resolve. And so I kind of consolidated all of her, not all of them, but like around 200 of her drawings out of like thousands into this 43 minute, excuse me, 43 minute codex where the drawings are paired with family photographs and 3D animation videos that have used the drawings. And in the middle of the video, you will see like um, <clears throat> 30 rendered versions of those drawings. I uh, traced the drawings, traced the lines, extruded them and made pipes and planes around them and built these sculptural forms so I could have a visual tableau and 3D animation, kind of like a painting, kind of like a Hieronymus Bosch painting or Pierre Della Francesca painting. And I can compile, and I, and I wanted to create this space with the drawings where I could use the text from the drawings thematically to kind of like string together narrative and composite my body into the space and build the whole lexicon that you see in my videos that today and the paintings and the sea prints and the sculptures, you know, yeah, it all kind cool. of like, you know, was the, the seed to my world building practice. Mm 
Right, absolutely. So let's show that clip now and then we can talk about it a little more. Okay, so I wanted to ask you um, about how exactly you translated your mother's pen drawings into 3D animations. There's something really striking about the way you do it because even in 3D, um, they still feel like drawings to me um, because you're so faithful to sort of the line. Um, but at the same time, you're bringing in these other elements like color and depth. So I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about how you approach that process of translation. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a very tactile and delicate process where I use a Wacom, um, like a, a tablet and a stylus, like a pen. And basically like, um, I just like, um, I uh, uploaded the, her drawings into Maya 3D animation program onto these planes and, excuse me. And I would, um, you know, uh, use uh, vector lines to uh, delicately uh, trace the graphite um, and the line weight of the graphite. Like um, the thing about, you know, uploading a drawing into an architectural program is that you could zoom in all the way down to the finest powder of the graphite. So it's this weird kind of like paradox that something as cold as digital technology can get to the like cellular human parts of like mark making, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, it's, you know, spending like a year doing that and made me understand her pathology with mark making and line making that kind of felt her like I inherited something, mm. inherited a spirit or quality of it. And so basically I kind of like, I traced them mm. and then um, there's this vector line, like say if it's a circle, right? Then I make the, like a circle this size or a circle this size. And I shift click that circle and I shift click the line and I hit, um, the extrude button and it makes a piping and then I choose the color of the piping and then be like a, a muted neutral gray or a muted neutral pink or like a turquoise or a viridian or a phthalo green you know um, and I kind of just use all of my color theory and principles that I learned from like a decade of painting and to kind of like figuring out how to like insert my own subjectivity to her drawings because they're black and white drawings so right. when I, once I build them out to be three dimensional, now it's up to me to create the add the sub, my own personal subjectivities to them, my own, you know, to advance to inherit her uh, blueprint and push it forward into like whatever I have developed in my own personal present day practices of, of, of consumption. Yeah. And so, basically, to answer your question, it's just like, you know that process and then adding planes to them and then stretching them out and expanding them and then just like allowing them to become their own thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll yeah. see that kind of evolve throughout your work in different ways as we go through these clips. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you how you selected the particular drawings for this video, because you mentioned that there was sort of a bigger pool of drawings and you narrowed it down um, to like a couple hundred for this video. What was it that like drew you to these particular drawings? What do you think like stood out to you? Um, at, they just, they were more specific and um, I felt like I could consolidate them thematically into different videos. Mm -hmm. Like the, you know, like with Country Ball, all those videos, I picked 35 of her drawings that dealt with American recreational material culture. 
Right. And Refine Desire 3, I picked all of her drawings that dealt with like um, medical, she would do these like pseudoscience medical drawings um, that were kind of like sort of Da Vinci and inventions that would fix her like problems with her health. Um, she would make drawings of pill capsules and x-rays and MRIs. And at, at the time I had cancer when I was a kid. And so like, if she wasn't allowed to come see me in the hospital because she had schizophrenia and like, it was just a, it's really personal, but it was just like this whole thing where she wasn't allowed to see me for my own personal health. So she would spend her time at home making drawings of MRIs and x-rays and like chemotherapy devices and stuff. It's, you know, it's just so weird. But like I in Refine Desire 3, I kind of explored those medical drawings and made it into this like really weird yeah. surrealist um, narrative. So like basically what I'm saying is when I paired all those drawings down for the Matrix Rhapsody, I, they, were, they were just like focused on themes, whether it was like recreational material culture, medicinal drawings, um, like uh, clothes, fashion, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Could you Capitalism. talk about, yeah, well, that's a big, that's a big theme throughout, yeah. but um, could you talk about the way it's actually like structured or sequenced? Because it's very different from kind of your later videos. It feels almost like a slideshow or like an album. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of like a, because it's sort of like a, a legend. You know, I consider my <laughs> practice, my practice is inspired by like, um. Dungeons and Dragons and Final Fantasy and role-playing games that I would play as a child. And when I would get those games, I would always have a strategy guide that would have like a map for me to understand the world. Like in Final Fantasy, you get like a strategy guide. And in the beginning, there was this like very linear schematic diagram that shows you like material, material, or like magic orbs, or swords, and uh, the maps where these fantasy characters come from. And so, I was considering, I was, you know, I was, uh, the strategy uh, to approach this body of work that I knew was going to take a decade to produce, <clears throat> I was, con I was like uh, designing it like a video game with a, a legend or a fantasy, like, you know, something that J.R. Tolkien or George, Mar J what's his name? Game of Thrones guy, J.R. Martin. Martin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <J. R>. Martin. <laughs> yeah. You know, that makes sense. Have yeah. To create the whole lens first, you know, and I realized that like my own personal, like, mythology and life is actually like that in its own way so that's yeah. that matrix rhapsody is taking on that form and it also kind of coincides with like score building and performance mm -hmm. history like in fluxus and the surrealist yeah. games exquisite corpse like dada games where they would like create these like performance scores for you to act out you know like Museums were acquiring a lot of performance scores from Marina Abramovic and like mm -hmm. Valley Export and Chris Beer. You know, just people, you know, from like historical figures, the performance score within the certificate was something so, you know, and the conversation at the time, it inspired me to like, you know, do a, a, a large, massive suite of performance scores. Mm, I love that. <laughs> you know? And that's what the Matrix Rhapsody is supposed to take on. Yeah, that makes sense. So you mentioned Country Ball. So why don't we go into that clip? Um, as you mentioned, it kind of incorporates your mom's drawings on the theme of recreation alongside a home video of your family and some other material. So why don't we watch that now? Okay, 
So tell us about the home video footage that was kind of the starting point for those. The home video footage was created around 1989. I was like three years old. Um, I was obsessed with it like for many reasons throughout my life. I think my family just liked watching that video over and over again. We had lots of home <laughs> videos, but that one in particular was interesting to me because originally I thought it was really cool and I made like works around it because it was this weird, it was a performance art piece in my family, first of all. And second of all, it was a Mother's Day cookout. Like all of my um, aunts and my mom, you know, every year they would have this cookout in the park in the country in South Carolina. We would congregate there and like eat food and dance. And it was just like, you know, a ritual. But like when I looked at the video, uh, uh, you know, deep into like into like my practice or whatever what I found the first thing I thought was interesting was that the video was a document of my sexuality you know like the perform the perform my gender performance and my sexuality and like you could see things I guess it was just like hints to me being gay and like I could see um you know like my family was trying to push me towards the boys and I was always running to the girls to dance like with them and stuff like that but then <clears throat> I continued looking at the video and I was like, well, that's not where the meat is. I was I was also noticing that this video was like, you know, I was reading Robert Ferris Thompson's Flesh of the Spirit um, and a lot about like, um, you know, West African culture and from, you know, you know, like ancient culture and like the history of West African performance, like uh, Nigerian Gelade masquerade mm -hmm. culture, where they celebrate the queen mother in this, performance ritual that lasts for days or weeks and they kind of you know it's something that's been happening for hundreds of years and and the evolution of this tradition is that they would make sculptures and make have a full-on interdisciplinary practice to come con to congregate and, and celebrate the queen mother they make headdresses in these and and all this stuff like in the headdresses would be so postmodern because like in the 1920s when like you know machines were flying over africa like planes and stuff like that and it, you know like make the headdresses like in, for inspired by the technology that was being developed and it was just very like quirky like that so it felt like this weird I felt I felt like a synchronicity with that mm -hmm. and then when I kept watching the video I realized well all the objects in the video have kind of like um all the objects in the video are the objects in my mother's drawings all the objects in the videos are recreational material culture that deal with like cakes and skyscrapers and like skyscrapers, but cakes and KFC buckets and aluminum foil and tabletops and carousels and slides. And I felt like I could find all the drawings that I could find, I could find drawings for each object in the video and I could recreate this world in 3D animation and mm -hmm. reperform re this narrative. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it was kind of like a way for me to, you know, Take my own performance certificate and reperform it, like how a museum is acquired performances yeah. so they can be reperformed. It was <laughs> yeah, using take my it as own a score. Yeah, camcorder and then camcorder footage and then reperforming it mm -hmm. with um, you know, reperforming yeah. you with um, uh, 3D animation. Right. So I wanted to ask you again about sort of the the technical process here, how you're importing live performance into 3D animation. Could you just talk about that for a minute? Well, um, I sold a lot of costumes and I, I was living in, Pro uh, what was it? when did I make this video? I made it in Provincetown at the Fine Arts Work Center, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I made it at, the, wow. I made it at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. I had a green screen in my studio and I sold all these costumes and I would dance in front of the camera for eight hours mm -hmm. a day. And then I would upload the footage and make image sequences out of my dance performance and all the dance performances choreographed around me using these objects that while well, I potentially wrote a scope of my hand so I would right. upload the dance footage composite those image sequences onto a plane in Maya and then I would rotoscope on my hands and my feet these like locators like mm -hmm. painstakingly like annoying detail work and I would attach the 3D animated objects that I built from my mother's onto my hand, like a like a like a, like a flag for, right. you know, like a, a if I was 
using ropes. And so that's how it, I look so integrated in the space. Right. And, and so, that's, yeah, no, go ahead. Mm-hmm. And so it's a very tactile and painterly process. It's just more four dimensional, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But again, it's this idea, like the tracing of your mother's drawings. It's this like kind of seamless movement between sort of the real world and the virtual world and, you know, refusing to like consider those two separate things, um, but really like overlapping them in really interesting ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's see. Um, I think we should actually get into the Hirshhorn's work now. This is Birds in Paradise. And I'm glad that you mentioned um, West African ritual because that plays a role in this work too. Um, so why don't we just watch the short clip from Birds in Paradise? So Jacoby, this is part of a six chapter project that you've been working mm-hmm. on for the past few years um, and recently completed. Mm-hmm. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that series? Um, so yeah, that series happened after I did a series called Reifying Desire and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art approached me, uh, the, the Frank Smeagol approached me to um, do a two-year residency performance thing there where they got this, I got this large grant to do whatever I wanted. And what I wanted to do was make a, um, I wanted to like complete this whole decade long process with my mother and where like Reifying Desire and Country Ball and projects before that were committed to translating her drawings into this universe. And then Verse in Paradise was more focused on the sound output that she made at, during my childhood and adulthood. Um, out, other than drawings, other than making like these schematic diagrams and these Da Vinci and drawings <laughs> that would be submitted to be invented, but the unpatented and like she was like submitting them to organizations. She was also writing melodies, jingles, and songs, trying to submit them to commercials or record labels. It was really crazy. <laughs> and when I was like, I thought it was psycho and weird and uh, then I realized that it was actually um, um, uh, you know as an adult like oh it's really really cool it's really amazing oh my god these acapellas are phenomenal the lyrics are beautiful the they're double entendres and the language that are like really compelling she's really talented songwriter Mm -hmm. Um, I want to make an American southern folk record that is happens to fuse electronic music and trip hop in jungle drum and bass. And then I want it to be a virtual reality visual album. And this was before, I actually was thinking about this before Lemonade and before all these visual albums came out, I've been trying to do this since 2008 <laughs> and like I finally found a way to do it. And so I started, I, I, I hooked up with my friend Nick Weiss and we, uh, for two years, we spent making, you know, we spent seven hours a day in the studio. Like I would make this album, making this album uh, from scratch. Um, and, and it was funny because the lyrics would influence the visuals. Like I would make, I would, I would pick a, a acapella that we, well, I picked 14 acapellas to work with out of the 155 or more. And the lyrics and the soundscape and the instrumentals that we were using 
influence what I would do with the video and vice versa. If I knew that the video needed to have a specific ethereal ambient moodiness, I would be like, right, this is what we got to get. This, I need this sound for this scene. And then sometimes I would come up with the sound in the music studio and be, and it would, I would make a, the scene go, you know, be guided by that. So it was like this very beautiful thing where um, like, you know, make like, see, mo usually I'm a music video director, but I was like, making the music and making the video. And so like, the, it was cool to like, see how they could influence each other. But um, basically like, it ended up being a six chapter visual album that um, is six parts to uh, video, uh, I think four of them, were two channel videos and the remaining two are one channel. And then there's like three or four virtual reality um, videos too. So it's like a virtual reality visual album. Right. That it was in and instantly, you know, it was very like, cause I wanted to bring back the like object hood to music, you know, like streaming, Spotify, iTunes, mm -hmm. Tidal, kind of like took away the CD and the A, A track and the vinyl record. And I was like, how can I bring the sculptural aspect of music back? I mean, how can I think like <laughs> what happens when the album becomes a virtual reality? You know, like having like the headset and this yeah. is just thought theory with the music. So you're looking up, down, left and right. And you and 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 every you have you have to listen to the album over and over again in order to like you see how the sound relates to the X axis versus the Y axis versus the Z axis and how the narrative can influence that. Yeah, that's so, so that's interesting. That's basically what that project was. Right. So this chapter, I think, like is related to a collaboration that you did with Solange, who also did a visual album. Yeah. Could you, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about like what it was like to work with her, kind of what that exchange of ideas was like? Well, so she... Um, definitely influenced the direction of Birds in Paradise, the particular video that, that bit, like I, I, I it, working with her is great. Solange is like a, a genius. She's so um, creative. Like she's just a really dynamic and well-informed super, super artist. Like she's really great. And she was really, and she really was like, um, when working, well, every time we work together, she's, um, she doesn't like, She's not, um, she doesn't apologize. She's not like, uh, she doesn't tiptoe around what she wants. And so uh, if she, in a way she kind of pushed me, mm -hmm. uh, pushed my expectations for myself. And I think like when we were working together, uh, we were exchanging ideas and mood boards and inspiration. And I think we just had a really like, like a, a symbiosis. Like we really kind of, we we're on the same wavelength conceptually. So like when she was talking, you know, we're the same age and we have we were arriving at the same kind of like sexual place at the same time and she was thinking about um her time and you know making this album that was more about feelings than politics and about going back home and something that's more about what made her who she was which is the rodeo and the cowboys in texas and like basically something rooted in like a certain kind of american african-american kind of like experience that in the south that i also relate to because i'm from the south too yeah. and so like basically like i kind of from trying from from taking a, st a step away from my point of view and entering hers i found more of myself mm. because we're both southern african-american people right and so i started thinking about this, like the symbolism, I guess like sometimes if you just get outside of yourself and you like, just, you know, you can actually, it's like a Roy shop test. You end up doing something that reveals more about yourself. So my response to what she wanted was to create something that was related to like circularity and um, um, sort of like a Saturn return thing, like a circularity of like, I wanted that, that was like, I wanted 360 degrees to be the motif. And so I started to create these rodeo spaces, these coliseums, mm -hmm. these spectator zones that kind of reflect virtual reality, which is like a coliseum is the most archaic way of doing virtual reality. Cause you can see, you know, it's like, it's the architectural way of looking at something in a right. certain way. And then I would make these like 
uh, our, um, and then it was like all these crop circles inside of the Coliseum with these cowboy kind of like aesthetics. But um, I think, um, what am I trying to say? What, how I just arrived, it helped me arrive to like um, a missing thread to link the other six projects together. I feel yeah. like I didn't articulate it as well as I normally do. No, that was amazing. That was fantastic. But I wanted to ask you to expand on the idea of like return. Um, I think somewhere you talked about this as being about finding home again or this idea of a return home. And I wonder if you could talk about like the role of home kind of in your work generally, even beyond this work. Well, it wasn't really, I don't know. I mean, I yeah. probably did say that. I think that, <laughs> I, I think I said that out of context or something, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's not necessarily about, I don't know, that's kind of a broad thing to say, to find home again. I think that like, you know, in Birds in Paradise, in my version, so Solange's version for when I get home, I use footage of Third Ward, Texas, inside of like um, being projected everywhere. Like you see like Texas everywhere. But in my video, you see um, a projections of me getting baptized by the Mami Wasa figure, like an yeah. African mermaid that takes me into the ocean and wipes me. This, I'm like covered in blue paint and she wipes me down and, and like turns me into, back into my pure form. Um, while this ritual is happening in this Coliseum. And I wanted to like, create a Afrofuturist science fiction version of this African ritual to kind of like speak about a sort of kind of healing process. Yeah. Um, I just, sometimes with making films, I pick a really large abstract motif to like describe in a really ambitious way as a method of like, um, you know, it's a sort of a method of finding out what my, you know, my true intentions are as an artist psychically. Like I'll like do something really broad and sometimes stupid. And 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 I and I find a middle ground between like describing that and meditating on it and building that ambitiously in a 3D animation. And then over time I figure out concepts of what I'm trying to achieve. And that's kind of how I approach the Birds in Paradise series. With mm -hmm. you know, after finishing all six videos, when I look at them from front to the end, now I know what it's about. I mean, yeah. I knew what it was about the whole time, but when the art is completed it really comes home. So it's just not one of those things you have to see. Right. The, the whole video is like, a, you have to see all the chapters to kind of link where, where what the journey is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you we know. have we have excerpts of the two final chapters. Um, mm -hmm. So why don't we show a clip first from We Are In Hell When We Hurt Each Other, uh, which came out last year. <laughs> Colby, you created this work last year during the COVID pandemic and also during the sort of racial justice protests um, following the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and many others. Um, and it's it's really the first time I've seen that current events kind of enter your work so directly. So I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about that decision to incorporate like the contemporary context in almost a more literal way. Well, yeah, so actually, <laughs> Um, um, yeah, that it, it, it is more direct, but it's in, in Burson in Blessed Avenue, 
the mm-hmm. second channel was like all about climate, had these climate change yeah, images from drones and the California fires and floods and like iceberg. It was sort of like that. It, it was, you know, that was more of a like nature global thing that kind of was being presented. And like in Refine Desire 6, there was some things too. But um, yeah, this was like more intense because, you know, last 2020 obviously was the, is the probably in our time frame of human history was really intense for everyone and I was trapped in a house making this work uncertain if like being an artist even mattered anymore uncertain if I would have be able to show these projects ever again like it was like my certain uncertainty was my 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 level my, my sense of certainty was like taken away from me and like the rug was like lifted beneath my feet and I you know people were protesting downstairs from my apartment during that summer my chest was hurting from stress about like just fear and panic and like right not not only is my health at stake I don't know what the hell is going on and I don't know if I should stay inside or if I should protest it's just crazy so when I was in this sometimes when I would, you know, when I did participate or when I did go out and observe the world, it's just like a very Boschian tableau, like it was surreal. So I had pulled out my camera and I recorded a lot of the protests and that was kind of like my mood board for the film. Mm-hmm. And what I thought I said, you know, like, like I said, I usually pick a motif that's really large and open-ended and I find a middle ground between that large open-ended motif and my like extreme obsessive touch within the process of making yeah. to figure out where does the concept and the ambition meet to make something that I don't know about yet. So I thought like, well, I want to make this 24 minute film, you know, like the protest footage and the pandemic is really inspiring. This, this, this is this film. My mom had this track from my album that I, you know, I, I had for the, the whole principle of Birds in Paradise is to make a video for every track. Yeah. So I realized, okay, it's time to do something for We Are In Hell When We Heard Each Other, which was already a part of the album since 2015. Um, and so, um, so I, I was like, okay, I wanna make this like potential narrative of a post something world <laughs> where, uh, these black female futurist figures are the only, it's like a, a, a alternative universe where the black female is the strongest thing in the world. She is the strongest in our world right now, but the alternative universe where she is immune to everything, like every kind of, uh, adversarial thing thrown at her way she can like hit yeah. like whether it's a biological threat or a weapon or anything and that's kind of the thing you see obsessively happening that's what I animated I mm-hmm. kind of you know I mo my body movement and put it into these female figures and the choreography is done all by me and wow. they're like I was gonna ask you that so it's you all my movement that's my oh, wow. body that's amazing and so, <laughs> and so like they're hitting all the orbs and beating them up and stuff like that. And you see that throughout and you see footage from a lot of racially like entangled footage subverted in the backgrounds. And Beth Ann Hardison, who is a famous model who found that who's one of the people who helped with my right. Uh, uh, one of Naomi Campbell's mentors, um, somebody who's helped um, bring black female visibility of strength to like consumerism capitalism in the fashion yeah. world and i i shot her upstate during that summer and i put her in the video and then at, and then like the end of the video you see okay you see the robotic women get more even crazier like right their ponytails like the strong everything yeah. then you see the protest footage in mccarran park um you see all these queer by plc people like liberated and protesting and being free uh, embedded on these concert stages and then it rises out to this huge chapel for Breonna Taylor and that's the big reveal at the end because it's about that it I just I, I felt like it was time for me to do something direct like that yeah but um but it was building up like when you watch the whole series you see that it was building because Avenue B 
has that energy. Blessed yeah. Avenue has that energy, and Birds in Paradise has that energy, and Moments of Silence has that energy. Has that energy, and then like the final videos where it becomes one channel, it focuses in on what the whole energy was in the first place, and then Shrines takes it all the way home, and then it's done. Right, it makes me want to watch them all in order. You were talking about wanting to sort of exhibit them all together at some point too. Oh yeah, I, def- I mean I showed them at four of them at Pioneer Works. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we, we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We'll see how it, we're, we'll see who does it, does it first. Yeah. Um. Okay, so we have one last clip that I wanna play um, from Shrines, which you premiered, I think last month actually at the Guangzhou Biennial. Yes. So let's play that. <laughs> I was really struck by um, the kind of like nesting of videos within videos, which is something that you've used in your work sort of since the beginning, since Country Ball. Um, but here it feels almost like um, like a Nam June Peak style video wall with all these little TVs playing footage. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. Well, but yeah, and that the the, the those stacked videos are uh, stacked TVs are also in Moments of Silence, the first chapter of Birds and Paradise. Oh, so nice. it begins with those series and ends with that actually, but yeah. yeah. I love that. No, I wanted to ask you um, first of that, like about the technique of nesting video within video, that kind of like layering of video that you seem to use a lot. Mm-hmm. And then also, if you could just talk about um, some of the source images and videos that you're incorporating in the clip that we saw. Um, yeah, well, um, so um, I approached that, I made that video really, feverishly um <laughs> after or directly after i finished the mitchell is a nash show last october yeah. um, so um i i well they all just kind of it's kind of like a venn diagram conceptually like i pick things that i feel like are intertwined and that clash against each other and that oppose each other and Mm. you know a lot of the drawings from my mother's archive influence some of the videos i choose like she made a drawing she loved the movie the color purple yeah um and she would make these drawings of the fashion and the hats and stuff and so that you know like i knew that like that was a great thing to incorporate into this piece because of the American history narrative. And I was thinking about the multi-American history and the polemics and that, like the conflicts and the chaos. And I just wanted to um, sort of make, um, it's sort of like a quilting process, you know? Mm, I love Fab- that. Um, you know, like it's like um, me quilting together a really contentious um, past that is sort of documented through media culture and also pulling from my own previous videos like country ball you see is inside yeah. of the monitor and then it's put with this 60 minutes documentation 60 minutes from in, on cbs footage of the, from the 80s of this like clan ritual where they're holding these flaming torches and then in country ball i'm holding a flaming torch and burning the american dream right. um and so it shows like it's sort of in a, in a way it's sort of like I kind of like, I'm a dancer and I kind of treat my work like dancing, like it's soulful and it's like about movement and rhythm and style and flow. And so I felt like that country ball video choreographically rhymed with that 60 minutes footage to sing with the color purple footage, the same, you know, like 
when I put footnotes in, it's just sort of like footnoted footage in there. It's sort of like, you know, clues to where, where my pathology is trying to kind of guide you. Yeah. That reminds yeah. me, I meant to ask you about um, sort of your dance practice earlier and totally forgot. So people often sort of mention the influence of voguing on mm -hmm. your practice, but you know, you've also mentioned a lot of modernist kind of dancers and choreographers like William Forsyth or Ana Teresa de Kiersmacher. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that kind of blend and how you developed it. Well, it's because I like modern dance. Well, you know, when I was in when I was in high school, I went to like a magnet school that I yeah. I lived on campus. It was like five hours away from my home, and I, you know, uh, the it was actually the best dance conservatory for high school or whatever. So I will have to go to these recitals and see modern dance performances all the time, and I really dug it and understood, and just there was this connection to it, and I had and I started researching it. And when I, you know, the little research that I've done, and little, you know, like for my, you know, my passion with like just looking at it as a fan, I found um, a, I found a, I found a, what I like about it is that voguing and modern dance is a conceptual sculpture process that's about phenomenology and animism. It's about these yeah. conceptual, it's about carving out and reacting to a space that's not there. And describing it with your body, resisting it with your body, carving it out with your body, is sort of like a drawing practice. Um, yeah. And it relates to the drawings that my mother was making and it relates to like how I will put the, you know, it just goes so well with a person who's trying to make 3D animated painterly videos yeah, <laughs> in absolutely. Maya. Um, so oh, yeah. it just felt, you know, and that's how I learned how to dance better because it was from necessity of making these films. Right, right. Okay, I have one more question for you, but in the meantime, if people have questions for Jacoby, like please feel free to send them using the Q&A button. Um, so I wanted to ask you about this word world building that's often used to describe your work. Um, and it's also in the title of our talk today. So I wonder if you could just kind of react to that word world building. Um, does that like speak to you? Are you interested in world building? Um, and if so, like, where does that come from? Do you think? Um, world building. Um, say that again. Sorry, I was looking at no, the no. list of attendees. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah, did you see any any friends? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I just I wanted to say like just react to the term world building. It's often used to describe your work. You're often called a world builder. Um, oh, people talk well, about, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I feel like at this point, it definitely is a world. Uh, I thought that was kind of absurd at first, but like I've been committed to it for 10, for so long. I feel like I'm in prison in my own world. And it's not, <laughs> like, I kind of want to live in the real world and like, you know, date some people and stuff. I can't, you know, like, I want to like, be a human being but unfortunately I am a prisoner so the world that I've been building and exhibiting for the past 10 years so like yeah world building is a major thing just because every single part about my practice I've been marinating on and threading out in the studio and archiving and using parts and components of it over and over again like you know when you're a painter you mix a palette and then you throw away the palette when the paint gets dry but like my palette never gets dry because it's all tech mm -hmm. it's all information and so like those colors and like, like the fonts and the the fonts the words the lyrics the drawings the sculptures right. the dance movements the films from youtube the films from my personal archive all of those things are kind of like you know I'm going to use them, I, you know, they all like kind of create this web of information that con that gels into like my own, yeah, my own weird thing. So it's, yeah, it's horrible. It's just like legends, You're creating a legend like in a video game. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Um, well, maybe you can give us a preview of what's next for you. Can you tell us what you're working on, what we um, should keep an eye out for? So you're done well, with, you're done with this big Birds in Paradise project. So what do you see coming after that? I'm working on a few things. I'm doing a painting show, and yeah. that's going to segue into this video game project that's sort of related to painting. And uh, working on a bunch of, I'm doing a couple of biennials this year and stuff. And 
I have a, like a three floor survey at Carnegie Mellon at the ICA Miller of my work from 2009 till 2021. And it, that we're producing a monograph book, like a 300 page book with it, which mm-hmm. is going to be cool. And we're going to have a, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming up. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask this question from Stephanie Kang. Um, she says, it seems as if repetition plays a significant part within your practice. For example, repetition of bodily movements or repetition of words within your mother's songs. Um, and when placed within a virtual setting, it seems to signify a glitch or a loop. How do you conceptualize repetition within your work? Um, oh, well, repetition is really important for anybody's work because it's like, when you re- repetition for abstract painters, you find a rhythm and a system with any repetition. And you can, like when you repeat something over and over again, it starts to lose its meaning and becomes flat and it becomes loud, it becomes a form. It doesn't, be- it loses its symbolism and its metonymy and mm. start to see sort of like the pure intention behind that form. So with repetition, I kind of like to exhaust and beat things down so they don't mean anything anymore. And so I can find like, like it's like, it becomes like a voice shock test. Right. I like to beat the soul out of something in order for it to become <laughs> something new. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Joshua Clagg, Clegg says, um, I was wondering how using your own past and experience of popular culture aids you in delinearizing your narrative of arrival. What do you feel interacting with this past does as a queer body? Oh wow! So how do I how do I use pop culture to delineate? To uh, de, I think delinearize, like to work with other notions of time that are not linear. Maybe that's how I'm interpreting the question. Well, popular culture in the world, I mean, for me, it's not even about, like, I really don't even like, there's no romantic relationship with the popular culture. I usually just like, it's sort of like in a way that like a collage artist would just have his magazine on the floor and then they like get the gel medium and apply it to the surface because it just adds a texture that really informs something else. Um, you know, I'm, you know, like I have Keith, uh, what's his name? Well, the guy from uh, Prodigy and my new piece. Oh yeah, yeah, he yeah, fled. yeah. The black and white like, photo. Yeah. And I like that video, but it was just because the texture, it had the black and white, the shirt, the mm. devil horns and the greased hair. It yeah. was just like a great texture for the dance movement in front. It was just like another layer to like really cement the motif, but there's nothing, ever, nothing like, romantic about it like it's nothing like ooh, I love Prodigy I mean I love Prodigy <laughs> but it's not like there's no there's no homage to anything you know it's sort of like it's all like just like networking textures right it's kind then, of sociopathic so. yeah well I don't know <laughs> not so bad I'm just joking. <laughs> okay so the second part of that question was, what do you feel interacting with this past does as a queer body? So I don't know if you want to respond to that part too, or just like the role of queerness in your work in general. Um, does it a queer body? Interact with the, uh, how do I, um, I don't even know how to answer that question. <laughs> uh, well, well, when you address the past, I mean, that, what it is, it's, it's, it sounds like a, I have to like a pull a RuPaul quote out of this for some reason. Like, you don't know yourself, how the hell are you going? If you don't love yourself, <laughs> yes. how the hell are you going to love someone? Else? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I interact with the past to, in order to resolve myself. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's great. So, Rita, um, Cognion, she's picking up on the repetition question that we were talking about earlier. She says, it's as if repetition of a single thing becomes a larger, more significant pattern. Um, I guess like something that I would ask you is just like, it's so interesting how you, when you answer these questions, you often go back to painting metaphors. Um, so for, for those in our audience who don't know your background, maybe you could just talk a little bit about kind of your development as a painter before you got into video and performance. Oh wait, so ask that question again. Could you talk a little bit about your background in painting? Oh yeah, well yeah. that's what I've been doing since I was a kid. 
Yeah. Uh, so I was like 11 or 12. And like I went, to, I did, that was my like concentration in my grad, in my high school. And when I was a major as in college, it was what I applied for to go to graduate school with. And what I kind of like segued away from when I was at Skowhegan. And like, um, it's just always informed, like it was the language, like when I switched over to what I'm doing now, I felt like an identity crisis. Like it was just like, um, it was almost like being gay and then all of a sudden saying you're heterosexual. Like, mm -hmm. what am I gonna do? <laughs> like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> I don't, it was just like a complete identity switch when I stopped right. doing it. And I felt it was necessary for me to take a long break. Hmm. but when I but like the the only way I knew how to enter everything else for the even till today was through the lens of painting through, right. like down to like the way I dealt with color texture light space depth of feel uh like uh the way I've dealt with surface the way I've dealt with like the idea of like the paint a good painting is about the history of the surface and the marks and erasure and adding mm -hmm. like evidence of like the body and the hand, like the just stall theory and like uh, abstract expression is about the body, evidence of the body, jumping, putting the body, like me doing this is sort of like in my videos is sort of like mm -hmm. an, a tribute to my, you know, like if de Kooning had this big brush, it's sort of like, and how am my movements inform the space, yeah. how my movements inform the 3D animation, how I trace the drawings and the graphite and add another layer to, it's all there. People think it's not there, but God damn it, open your mind, it's all there. <laughs> it's literally all there. Yeah, I can't stand I when people are like, how was he talking about painting in this? I'm like, people are flat <laughs> and basic, like it's there. I know there's painting, there's sculpture, there's like Lee Bontecu I wanted to talk yeah, about and we didn't have time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but I think we should probably stop there because we're coming up on eight o'clock. Yeah. Um, so Jacoby, I just want to thank you so much again for joining us tonight and very generously sharing all of these clips with us. It's been great. Thank you. I had so much fun. Oh, I'm glad. And then I also want to thank Antonio and Lindsay um, for their assistance with the interpretation and captioning um, and for Rebecca, who's been managing our slides. Um, and finally, just a big thank you to everyone who's tuning in here and on the other platforms. Um, Please join us for our final artist talk of the season next Wednesday. It will be with the incredible photographer, Deanna Lawson. So that should be a great one. So thanks again, Jacoby. Thank you. And see you soon. Bye. See you soon. Bye.